What's up, everyone? Welcome to Let's Cool One with Jack Macklin. Uh, we have a great episode for you guys today. We're just going over a couple topics. It was recently Jazz Fest here in Chicago. I went for three out of the four days of Jazz Festival. There were so many amazing shows there. Some of the highlights were Kenny Garrett, of course, but also Oren Evans, the Spanish Harlem Orchestra, the Afterfest Jam session with with uh, Bobby Watson. It was all amazing. Uh, we have our founder of Alethio here today, Tassos Kirkos, joining us also. What's up, everybody? Uh, thanks for having me, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. Tassos was at Jazz Fest, so we're going to kind of weigh on weigh in on him for a, uh, a perspective about what the festival was like and uh, what the music was like to him. But that w- that's one of the th- one of the things where Jack we're also hitting. didn't get a guest for today, so <laughs> just <laughs> sorry. More guests in the future. More, more guests in the future. We're gonna have more guests in the future. That's definitely the plan here, and uh, we're just still getting the ball rolling. But uh, we're glad. Thank you for everyone for joining us on Let's Cool One. I'm gonna start off with a little tune. You know, I've been. Um, I just got this gig recently, which I'm very thankful for. I'll get, go into more detail later, but I uh, want to use this podcast and platform as also an opportunity to uh, to perform a little bit. So I'm going to uh, play a song. Let's see. I think I'm going. What are you going to play? I think I'm going to play a little original. Okay. All right. Original here. Um, uh, let's see. The original I'm going to play is entitled Jelly Bean. Jelly Bean. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Jelly Bean? Yes, that was Jelly Bean. Right on. Yeah, so you can find Jelly Bean on um, all streaming platforms under Jack Macklin. That's under my first EP. So that was a special little acoustic version of that song. I think it was super chill. Have you talked a lot about like the music you have put out on the show yet? I haven't talked a lot about it. You know, I do have um, an EP out and two singles and uh, definitely have a record that I still need to put out. I've been kind of sitting on for a while for the right moment. Um, you know, I have two singles out from that new record, which I'm super proud of. It's two original songs, Moments, uh, featuring Parker Kaplan and my good buddy, Ryan Brasley. Ryan Brasley and I grew up in St. Charles together, so we went to high school together, and he's the... Uh, really talented drummer so i was super stoked to have him on on my recording and he's on the album i'm releasing as well uh my ep you can buy on my website it's also um you know available on all streaming platforms so it's called one i really that that features three original compositions one original composition from the bass player and one um one cover of George Benson song that we we played. It's actually Jose Feliciano, but made popular on George Benson's Breezen album. So yeah, what was it like? Actually, what is the process for somebody maybe that doesn't really understand a whole heck of a lot? What is it that like goes into making an album and like what were the kind of steps you took? Maybe maybe looking back now. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I... Um, Did you just kind of, like, throw it together? Like, is that... Like, you're just like, oh, I, like, let's do this. And you pick the songs and you right. go. Yeah, I mean, I like, something that I want to... I would definitely want to record in, in the near future again. And the whole process can look like a very bunch of different ways. For me, what I did is, like... Just kind of had a gig, and that's something that I'm looking for now is something. I had this weekly gig at Roses when I recorded my EP here in Chicago. And um, I just had a band, and I built up the band. We built up music together, and we had a, a whole thing and a whole show that we did, and a lot of originals, a lot of uh, arrangements. And then we eventually just decided that we should record. And um, I feel like that's kind of kind of the way it goes is like, uh, you you build something up with the peers or um, people you like playing with, and you you know know you have a thing, and then you say we should we should record, you know. And uh, the process could look different from a bunch of different ways. Like we did it here in Chicago, and I paid the guys for the record, and I also paid the um, paid for the studio time, and um, and yeah, but I I don't know how many. I mean, I don't, I don't really know if I want to pay that much in the future to make a record. I mean, I feel like that's just how it goes, though, is like you have to pay money to play a little bit with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I think I'm ready to make a next record now and I'm still kind of figuring it out. But the it looked different every time, like my the second one we recorded the singles from like the studio time was free, you know, and we uh, I didn't really have to pay like much of anything to the band or that one for that record. Which is like was really grateful, and I think that if I make a record again, I mean, like I'm gonna try to pay people, or if I have like want to have really special guests, like people who are really good and established, I would probably pay them to do it and to join. But I think paying the musicians is definitely fair. But uh, yeah, at the same time, it's like it's it, it costs so much out there to to uh, to be able to do it when you like yeah you know when you're friends enough with the guys that you just like kind of it's something that you do together right and you end up getting the yeah it's you like when you're friends with the with all the people you can ask them to do it you built up a band they're passionate about it you can definitely ask them to um to record for you and that's like a that's a cool thing when you do, when you build friends like that and you have that band because that only happens like a few times you know, um, doesn't happen very often where you have a really good band you want to record and usually want to stick together with those people, you know. Um, but jazz is like a little bit different. I mean, is it historically a little different? I know I want to like. Yeah. But, um, uh, I am. I'm asking since we're since we're on it. I mean, most jazz recordings are like 
do they do people stay with the same they band want, or they want to like jump around, you know, and like play with different people all the time on different recordings? Um well, um most jazz jazz jam sessions um they the dates like they go by really quick. Like most people go in there and they uh like record in like 4 hours, you know. It's like yeah. especially if you have really good people who are uh, recording or playing with you in the studio, it's like the session shouldn't take long and people, and like, there's a lot of freelancing. So like, if you're a jazz musician, like people, you're able for hire, basically people will hire you to be on their record and you get a certain amount of money for that. You get a certain amount of money for another record date or in the past it's worked with like people have contracts to like blue note or there's like their record contract to, uh, whatever record label they want, Columbia Records, you know, Criss Cross Records, a little bit more modern or like, uh, you know, that type of thing to where it's like you get a record deal, Steeple Chase, you get a record deal to be on these labels and they pay you to make albums and then you call people in who are maybe on the record label who are not on the record label, you know, um, it's, uh, yeah, but. Uh, so, you, wait, so there are jazz albums out that like, maybe the person whose name is on it like isn't really picking the people on it yeah for sure i mean that's definitely a thing you know if if you're if it's like a big record label or in i think it you know if they they get you a good band i mean there's there's mark whitfield records from the 90s and it's like he got a record deal mark whitfield's a fabulous guitar player i really like him um but it's like he had all these amazing, amazing musicians on there, like Kenny Kirkland and all these people. And it definitely seems like, you know, I mean, maybe Mark Woodfield hired him to do it, but it seems like it's more of like a record label thing, hired him to do it. Um, hired those people to be on there. And there's like the, also the legendary story of like the Beatles records where there's like, you know, um, uh, Bernard Purdy is like supposed to be playing instead of Ringo, you know, on like Rubber Soul and all that stuff. And that's just like who the record label bought. Do you want to talk about Jazz Fest first or did you want to mention that gig that you got last week that, that you're now having this week? Um, oh, we could talk a little bit more about recording, too, before we get to that. Right, we're kind of right. we're just in the intro. But yeah, the recording whole thing, it looks so different than it did in the past. And what I was going to get to is that, like, you know, a lot of jazz musicians, especially the best ones, are like on a ton of different records. You look at Roy Hargrove. He was on from D'Angelo's records to um, his own records to, you know, Johnny O'Neill records, tons of people's records. Johnny O'Neill, like all these people, like uh, this past weekend, Bobby Watson, you know, a great example is, is best known for being in Art Blakey's band and recording with Art Blakey, you know? So it's like, that's where he got his start and then he went on to do his own thing. So it's like, you know, definitely recording with a bunch of people and being in other people's bands is like a highly sought after thing to do. Peter Bernstein on guitar, you know, recorded with so many different people, you know? And like, he's like the top jazz studio guy as well as top jazz musician. And, um... Yeah, I mean, sure, he gets paid well for a lot of those dates, you know, that he's doing. But recording looks so different than it did back in, like, the 70s and 80s, 90s, 60s, whatever. Uh, now it's like we can do it from home and we can record a record from home. So it's, like, it's super different, you know, um, than it's ever been in the past with getting a date. You get uh, some a record label approaches you and they're like, here's a, here's some money make five records for us. Here's $10,000 or whatever it is, maybe more, maybe less. And, um, you're in that date record date now. And like, uh, you're in that contract and that doesn't really exist anymore. You know, it does for some people, but for not, not others, you know, but that's like a want though. Like you want, maybe, would, maybe you personally, or maybe like, even just if you're speaking to like improvisational musicians in general, um, like is is that kind of an end goal, right? Like to be yeah, signed to, be, to a contract? Yeah, that we're, I mean, you know? so for me, I think the end goal would be to create my own label. You yeah. know, in that and like to to have enough, you know, wherewithal and have enough um, establishment in the scene or in like a certain area to where my label would, would look prestigious. Or you know, if something's on my label, it would be a, like great music, and you would know that I signed off on it. Yeah, you know, and um people who are doing that now that I, you know, is, uh, 
Caligram Records. That's Jeff Bradfield. He teaches at NIU. He has a great label. And I saw their performance at Jazz Fest this weekend. One of my hi- the highlights. Get into that later. But um, that's an amazing record label. I would like I would like to start my own somehow. Kurt Rosenwinkel has his record label, and he's like put different people on. But I think it's just like a it's a broader thing that I can do to to help other musicians and myself as well. And also, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I wanted to get into um, that's just a little bit on recording. Uh, yeah, I mean the recording the industry. Hit is- hit us with that tangent a little bit but i you know yeah, you, you mentioned your own recordings and i was like oh we yeah gotta- that's something i want to do in the future you know i still have a couple things uh i want to record with some homies in nashville it's officially been like a month since i moved back to chicago so that feels great you know i um miss a lot of the homies in nashville still but i'm excited that i'm here back in chicago i actually got a a gig at um, this Mediterranean restaurant, Elia. We're going to go into that a little bit. Might as well go into it now. Um, I was this past week, you know, still need to do it more as always. But this past week I was hustling gigs at um, basically hustling gigs means like going door to door, asking these places. If yeah. yeah. If they, if they want to do live music and I got a lot of interesting responses. Some people were down. Some people were not down. Um, some people were like, email me. Some people are like, do this, that, and the other. But basically, it's like, I want to play music. And so I'm going to go into places and try to get a gig, you know? And um, so I went into um, this Mediterranean restaurant in uh, the like Humble Park area called... Um, What's it called? Elia. Elia. Yeah. Elia Chicago. Elia Hot Chicago. Start. <laughs> it's called Elia Chicago. And um yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool little spot. They have uh it's Mediterranean food and it's like a duo gig. So I'm playing duo with an upright bass player yeah. from six to nine. But I was like going to all these venues, hustling all these places, and I finally went into this place. Elia was like the last place of the day talk to the manager, uh, get his number. Then I finally, he follows me on Instagram. I finally DM him back. I was like, Hey, what's up? Like we should get something worked out. You know, he liked my music. I have videos I posted on Instagram. We organized a rate and then we, uh, now I'm playing there. So come check me out Fridays and Saturdays at from six to nine. Uh, at You're LA, be there Chicago. this Friday. I'm going to be there this Friday. Yep, this Friday and this Saturday. I got Simon Chacho for Friday. He's a, He also recorded bass on my EP. He's a uh, longtime compadre for sure. And um, I got this new guy who I met this past weekend at the Bobby Watson After Fest Jam Session, uh, Ruben Stump. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Ruben Stump, he he's with, from Lansing, Michigan. He studied with Rodney Whitaker apparently. But um Ruben is going to be stumping, that's for sure this Saturday night at the Elias Chicago. Um that's going to be sick. So maybe, you you like the gig? Yeah, we did it once. Uh I did it like a trial run. That, I've never been, but like cool spot. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's on like divisions like a super sick area and um yeah, we're playing right out front. There's like lights on the patio. It's a beautiful patio. The food's amazing. Uh, the music is great. Uh, I think it's a great vibe. You should definitely come by and, and see, check it out. Uh, check out the restaurant, support it. It'd be amazing. But yeah, it's amazing. Like, I couldn't say enough good things. Like, it's a busy area. People were stopping and saying, What's up? You know, we have a. Uh, we're playing requests, you know, where the food is great. The drinks are great. The staff's really cool over there. Um, yeah, hopefully it keeps on going for more. What, what, all right. So as a non-professional musician, um, what is the number of requests before, like, you guys are annoyed? And is it one? Like, is it if one person comes up and asks you to play a song, maybe that is, like, just totally out of left field from where you're from where you're um like the genre you're playing in you know um i mean it just depends on how much they're gonna tip you know <laughs> fair enough <laughs> like if they tip we'll we'll play any song you know especially if it's like a hundred dollar bill or some shit we'll be like take my pants off for that you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'd like you know 
I'd uh, give him a high five and a kiss, maybe, for a $100 bill. You want to talk about uh, Jazz Fest? Yeah, let's transition into Jazz Fest. But yeah, Alia Chicago. So that's Friday and Saturday. Definitely come check me out. It's going to be cool. Um, Jazz Fest, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Tassos and I went uh, Saturday night. I went all weekend, but Tassos met me there Saturday night um, to see the great Kenny Garrett. What did you think of that show? It was awesome. It was really cool. I... um you know my a, a lot of like the really cool stuff that i've found in improv has been from from you largely like showing me a lot of really cool music um and then just like other people in college being in music school for a couple years you um you know pick up on like what other people are listening to and like who you like as like as in me you know as an individual and Kenny Garrett was like someone i really loved for just the last 5 years i've just been listening to a ton of Kenny Garrett and um I didn't even really know that he was headlining Jazz Fest and that it was free. Like, I didn't even really put two and two together until you had said it. Like, I'd been to Jazz Fest before, obviously, like, a good handful of times, but um, I loved it. Like, it was really fun. I uh, thought he put on a show, you know. That, that's what you said, that it was, like, way more of a uh, performance than I... And I thought so, too. Like, I, it was... Um, I, I asked you in the middle of it, is that, like, the biggest crowd, do you think, that... Kenny Garrett plays in front of the whole year and you were like, Oh, I don't know. Like probably not. And I was like, Oh, probably though. Um, just like it was a, there were a ton of people there. Like, and, and then we could get into the other part of that show too, that, uh, we were talking about after where there were just a lot of people leaving, you know? Right. Right. Um, I mean, Kenny Garrett's a master. It was awesome. Masterful, masterful. You, um, you can talk I'll about talk, it more, but you, you, you threw it over to me. So I was just, no, uh, yeah, yeah. Go um, ahead. Uh, I thought I thought it was awesome. I don't, I, you know, I don't know. That's an interesting thing you brought up. But I, I don't know if that's the biggest crowd that he plays for because he's an international. It might not be. Yeah, you yeah. know, he's an international alto saxophone player, and there's people in Europe that are crazy for for jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, and so there's huge festivals, huge festivals over there that like tons of people come to. And the Chicago Jazz Festival is a huge free festival for sure, and there was a lot of people there. It probably is one of so the I biggest. Might be under, I might be undershooting. You know, Kenny it Garrett, might, though, he, a him, bit. him, yeah, him, and like, you know, probably like five to ten other performances of that size per year. But yeah. I, you know, I, I think that like, if it's not like a huge performance at that, like, it's small venue that pay. It's like, you know, paying uh, him a lot of money to be paying there. him a lot of money to be there, and like the tickets are really expensive. You know, yeah, like you're not gonna go see Kenny Garrett usually for at least under fifty dollars ticket. You yeah. know. Unless he's like sitting in at a club somewhere, which I don't know if he really would. I was hoping he would pull up to uh, the jazz showcase and jam there on the, Saturday for the yeah for the yeah. afterfest jam session, but they he didn't. I went to that, which was also I can get into that a little later. later. Um, yeah, I can get into that a little later, but uh, um, I thought that Kenny Garrett was so sick. Uh, he had his uh, sounds from the Ancestors band. I don't know if you've listened to that rest record. Yeah, Tassos. oh yeah, yeah. But he, he wrote a couple right tri couple tribute songs on there. Like he has that Hargrove tune for Art's sake on there. Like uh, he played both those tunes at the at the fest, and uh, he like reprised like a bunch. Like it, he was playing Happy People. Yeah, and I made it on the probably on for the like a, yeah, I made it on the screen. He was probably playing Happy People for how long? Like thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah, it felt like it. it did, no, it probably was twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah. Ba 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 you know, and, and it was the happy people was second to last, correct? But it went on for a long time, right? And yeah, they played Wayne's thing at the end, which was sick. Yeah, it was sick. Um, but it did go on for a long time. So you had a lot of people leaving. And, you know, I, I think at some of them, like, you know, at the times when they went down and then like jumped right back into it again, like they did that like five times. And, um, I think a lot of people didn't really understand that that wasn't the end of the song. And then that there was another song after that, you know, that was really great if you had stuck around. So, 
Um, yeah, they did like an encore. Yeah. Well, they, they did that thing too where uh, they announced a guy and then he would walk off stage. Yeah. And then they like, everyone else would keep on playing. It was sick. It was like, really cool. It and Kenny cool. Garrett is just like a master showman and musician and he like displayed his mastery there. And then at the end, it was just like Kenny Garrett playing alto saxophone player, alto sax for the whole fucking crowd. And it was like, it was so sick. And, um, he was like, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. How do you think you would be in a crowd like that, that size right now? Would you be playing it if I were to perform? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That size? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I would love it. Especially doing music like that. That'd be so cool. It'd be like, I'd definitely be really I'm nervous. talking, you're like the lead man. Like, how do you, what is your what like are you trying to like hype the crowd up and be like i can't hear you <laughs> um i mean kenny garrett's been doing that shit for years so it's cool to see how he does it you know because it's like i didn't really know he like would rap over his song sometimes so, like just here and there like it was really awesome like i really enjoyed that and it was something i didn't know yeah he would i mean it's all you know music you know jazz baby i don't know what you want to say that is but uh you know, he, he was doing his his thing, man. And, like, rap is kind of, like, comes out of the same tradition as yeah. a lot of jazz. And so it was cool to hear him do that over, over... What, what songs did he rap over? A few of them. It was, like, half more than half the set, it felt like. Yeah. Yeah, and then he had a singer as well. He had an upright bassist, who actually I saw perform in New York not that long ago, which I was like, oh, damn, I didn't realize I knew him. But, um... Uh, I forget his name, but he was killing and the pianist was, um, Keith Brown, Keith Brown. I think he's like, I think he's from Knoxville, Tennessee, where I was like, it's not too far from Nashville. And they, uh, I think it's like Donald Brown or something down there is, I the, got you. don't worry. I'm locking it up is the, the, um, producer of some of Kenny Garrett's records. And he, uh, teach used to teach at like the University of Tennessee, and he's like huge from from Knoxville. He played with Art Blakey too, and all that, all that. Um, I love it how if you played with Art Blakey, it just makes you a goat. I mean, it does. Art Blakey's the goat, you know. Is he? Yeah, I mean, he was known for like being the last like really official school of jazz and all that stuff, like before jazz school would exist, and he's like mentored so many young musicians. Him and Miles, of course, but um, Art Blakey, yeah, is like he mentored so many young musicians. It's crazy. Is like what there's something was something like seventy something jazz messengers, but um, yeah, that leads me to um some of my for favorite performances at Fest overall. What did you think of the whole like layout and setup of the Chicago Jazz Festival, having the two tents over there and like with the that. performance? I, I, was it different than it had been before? Yeah, uh, yeah, they had like a WDCB lounge, which was like super cool. You could go over there and like lounge out and listen to some music, and that's where I saw the Caligram Records, which was my teacher Scott Hesse, Dana Hall, and. Clark Summers and Jeff Bradfield and Chad McCullough play. They played some awesome, brilliant music. It was so sick. And, um, yeah, that was super cool to hear them play. They sounded amazing. That was probably one of my favorite performances at the festival. And then another one was Oren Evans. Oren Evans was amazing. That was with, that was on Sunday with, um, I'm so glad that I went to that. That was so incredible. It was uh, uh, Oren Evans with who was on bass was was Robert Hurst and Mark Woodfield Jr. and it's a saxophone player. And then there was the Dr. Eddie Henderson quintet, and that was um, Eddie Henderson on trumpet, Donald Harrison on alto. Uh, Mike Clark on drums, uh, Gerald Cannon on bass. Gerald Cannon is amazing. I was seeing all those guys there and playing was incredible. I saw Gerald Cannon play at Smoke with Cyrus Chestnut. Okay. Cyrus Chestnut's this killing jazz piano player. In the New York, there's this amazing club called Smoke. 
and uh, it's like a supper club, but it's a really cool jazz club. And he was playing Cyrus Chestnut, and it was it was sick. Okay. But uh, Gerald Cannon was playing with Eddie Henderson, and that was like that was an amazing show too. I mean, holy smokes, you know. So best those are your best performances of Jazz Weekend. Yeah, I mean Eddie Henderson for sure was amazing. Orrin Evans blew me away. The Caligram Records thing was really sick. The um, the Alexander McLean project was really cool. That's D Alexander and John McLean. They have a project together, and um, that was amazing show. The favorite part of Fest though was the um, was the Bobby Watson jam session. Okay, and that was at the Jazz Showcase. And uh, Bobby Watson is like a really amazing alto player. He like we got to jam together a little bit, which was sick. But on Saturday for Sunday there, um, Robert Hurst and Oren Evans came through and they like jammed at the the showcase. They played rhythming and it was so sick with Kyle Swan on drums and Bobby Watson played on that too. But um. A ton of musicians showed up to jam, and it was so fun. And I got to play a tune uh, with some cool, really good musicians. And uh, yeah, we had a ton of fun. That was a uh, super. You know, I think going to jams are a great thing to do, especially like, you know, if a jazz messenger like Bobby Watson is hosting a jam session. I mean, that's super dope. You know, should be going to that shit all the time. Jam session. You know, if you're a want to be a musician or whatever you know i feel like going to like those things are amazing thing to do and um i met a bunch of cool cats there and a bunch of really awesome people who were hanging out and uh love some people who i love don't have on the show but i think that one thing was great for the community you know great um great to great me. that it's free too great that it was free too you know i don't think it was free for everybody it was free for musicians you know well, the jazz fest was free. I meant too. oh, the you know, jazz just the whole fest. weekend. Yeah, was. the whole weekend was free. So those are some of my favorite shows. I feel like the most inspiring show definitely has to be the Orrin Evans band because they just like they kind of played avant garde, but it was like also music and um, like it was songs and melodies and uh, you know just like playing in an environment where there's like so many people like there to see a jazz quartet is like cool cool as hell you know yeah because it just like means that that music is important and like um it's like a really important gig and like you know not everywhere it's like where you feel like all or all gigs all the time you feel like what you're doing is really meaningful but like i think the performances there like are super deep and meaningful and it's really cool to see that um that's Saint, that's chicago jazz weekend yeah yeah when saint charles the saint charles um jazz weekend yeah that's saint Ch- chicago jazz festival the saint charles jazz weekend is... oh my bad <laughs> <laughs> uh, um that one is um was it not a weekend was was the festival not nah, over a weekend I mean, it's the same thing i don't know it's just how they brand it you know <laughs> um what do you think brendan what do i th- what do i think about about the weekend it sounded like uh, no like the words weekend and festival they're interchangeable <laughs> yeah yeah in this no. case i'm gonna i'm gonna have to hop on tasso's side because i'm a casual too or, well, Tassos is, Tassos is less of a casual than me. You no, know, Brandon, I'm, I'm definitely a casual. Uh, would you go to the Chicago Jazz Festival, Brandon? Man, I mean, so, supposedly it's free, so. It is free. I don't, you I don't see any reason not year. to. Yeah, yeah you should check free, it out next year for sure. Yeah, yeah. That, that's an entry for a lot of people, I'd say. Like, something free. Think about it like that. Yeah, it was super cool. I mean, they had, like, they sponsored so many shows uh, leading up to the festival, too, that were free. Uh, the Larry Brown Trio at the Jazz Showcase was free, and that was sponsored by um, WDCB, who also sponsored the Chicago Jazz Festival. And um, they're an amazing partner, you know, with the with the Chicago Jazz in general, um, which is, is super cool and good for them. I would love to ingratiate myself with them. Yeah, I would love to work with them in the future. Please reach out. No, we will be reaching out. We, yeah, we, we will be. Um, we'd love to partner with them. 
But yeah, I'm playing three gigs for the St. Charles Jazz Weekend, with WGCB is also a sponsor for, which is amazing. Um, but the, the lineup looks killing over there. A lot of people from St. Charles who I graduated high school with and a lot of other people above and beyond that are performing that weekend. There's performances all around the St. Charles area. Um, they have some on the St. Charles Jazz Weekend website, you know, so uh, you could pull that up for me yeah, if I'll you want and like read off some of the names on the schedule um because they have like a ton of uh really great performers do you know the dates or do you need me to read the dates september 12th to the 15th no i knew that i oh, knew okay. it was on the 12th right. to the 15th yeah i have a gig at the saint charles history museum five to seven on the 12th and that's going to feature uh kyle swan on drums and mike benning on bass I have a gig at the filling station um, on Saturday. The th- no, I have Friday the 13th is at the the St. Charles History Museum. Oh, here you are at Jack Macklin Trio. Do you want me to read off some of these names? Yeah, read off. See who's performing. Andrew Gizio. We went to school with him. Um, so I, that's, a, that's a familiar name for me. The Chris White Trio. Derek Gardner. Diego Rodriguez Big Band. Eric Skay. Is that a guy? I'm not sure. I don't Eric, know. Yeah. Eric Skay Trio. Yeah, guitar player, seems like. Frank Catalano. Glenn Miller Orchestra. So what is the Glenn Miller Orchestra today? Because I know it's uh, not the, the same Miller thing. The Glenn Miller Orchestra performing in St. Charles? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but like, Glenn Miller's not like alive anymore though, correct? I don't think so. So, no. <laughs> but aren't there aren't there like bands like that yeah, that still it's travel like, around it's like that are holding on that... his legacy? You okay, know? like the Count Basie band yeah. still exists, or the the Monday Night Vanguard band at the Vanguard. It just like carries on the the legacy of like Thad Jones and Mel at the Vanguard band. It's probably the best one. But uh, even after the leader passes away, they keep going. That's not like yeah, they just band the band just keeps on booking gigs and going. You know, really. Yeah. Is that not like property of like Glenn Miller, you know? I don't think that um <laughs> I don't think that that that's like a huge thing. I think Glenn Miller is probably like stoked to get his music being played more still. So they're playing like mostly his music still. Yeah. Okay. That's cool though. Yeah. Um let's see who else we got on here. Yeah, you got long hair in this picture that they used too. Joel Ream, uh John Weasley. Neil Algar, uh, Nick Glover, and all these guys are getting shout outs right now. Samuel Wyatt or any of these, you know. Steven Knight Trio. Ten Cat Swing. Jimmy Faraci, your old roommate. Yeah, Jimmy. Yeah, go out and catch him. Wayne Mesmer. Do you know who Wayne Mesmer is? Yeah, he used to sing the anthem at the with the Hawks. And and yeah, he does it with the Chicago Wolves now. Uh, and he got shot in the neck, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, and he's making like a, a comeback. Yeah. That's, That's crazy. Cool. So you can go out and hear Wayne Mesmer at the St. Charles Jazz Weekend. Uh, but you also can go out and hear me. We're also playing Sunday at McNally's, and that should be a fun gig. That's with uh, Simon Chacho and Kyle Swan. So um, I'm thankful for those guys for being down down to play with me. You know, That's a killing band. But yeah, St. Charles Jazz Fest is a weekend is going to be great. Um, moving on, I wanted to introduce two new segments I wanted to talk about, and then we can wrap it up here. Um, I wanted to talk about record of the week, and uh, the record of the week that we're going to talk about, and be and we can discuss more in detail next week. But I've already listened to it, and we can give you guys a chance to listen to it when we dis- before we discuss it in detail next week with our fellow guest or we can add a segment later on in the show but we'll we'll get it to you our segment of record of the week and the record we're going to be listening to is monk's music by thelonious monk do you know thelonious monk tassos i know of him i i'm not i remember a while ago this is years ago you were talking about getting a thelonious monk tattoo so uh anyone worth um <sighs> memorializing in tattoo form is definitely an inspirational human being though. Yeah, for sure. I know some of his music and I, you know, but not, I don't know the power to which he, 
influenced a lot of what exists today. You know, I don't really know a lot, but I know it's a lot is yeah. my answer. Yeah. He's influenced a lot of people and a lot of musicians. He had his own specific unique style of playing and his own way of composing. And um, he's a brilliant pianist. Brendan, you ever heard of Thelonious Monk? Uh, I think you brought him up in the, the last podcast I did with you. Yeah. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> well, our it. title, Let's Cool One, is named after a Thelonious Monk composition. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's why I know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's Cool One is a Thelonious Monk song. So shout out to Thelonious for that name. And, um, you know, now we're using it for our podcast. Let's Cool One, inspired by Thelonious. But anyway. Do you want me to read a little bit about uh, Monk's music? Yeah. Uh, hold on. After this, you can all read right, a little right. bit about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I, for, I, for my first listening, a couple listings of that record, it's with Art Blakey and um, Art Blakey, Coleman Hawkins, John Coltrane, um, uh, Gigi Grice is on there. Wilbur Wayne. Where? Wilbur, Wilbur Ware. Ware is on bass. Yeah. And, um, yeah, Art Blakey's on drums and Monk is on piano, which is amazing combo to hear with Wilbur Ware. They, there's um, it's amazing to hear Coleman Hawkins play uh, "Ruby, My Dear." But yeah, read a little bit about it, Tassos. Um, came out November 1957 in November. Um, or I said that, uh, but it was recorded June of 1957. Uh, it was. Uh, the studio was Reeves Sound Studio in New York City. Um, the producer was Oren Keep News. Um, this was the first Riverside Thelonious Monk album recorded and released in both mono RLP tw- uh, 12242 and stereo RLP uh, 1102. So um, the stereo re- the stereo version was released nine months after the mono release in August 1958. Hmm. Apparently, it has been noted that the mixes of these releases are extremely different. The stereo mix, while featuring... This is from Wikipedia, by the way. uh, While featuring the same performances as does the mono version, used uh, an entirely different set of microphones suspended from the ceiling, while the mono release used microphones in closer proximity to the instruments. As a result, the stereo mix has a more distant sound, and Wilbur Ware's bass is much less audible. What do you think about that? Hmm. That makes sense. Um, I think I know the version where you can hear his bass. Maybe I don't. I'm not sure which version I know. Um, that's something that's probably good to know. But man, that record sounds amazing. They play um, "Booba Da Ba," "Booba Do Ba," "Booba Dee Ba," "Booba Dee Ba." The one song that's apostrophe on there. You know, apostrophe. <laughs> I don't know that one. You're asking the wrong guy if he knows these ones. The album was also inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2001. I don't know if you knew that either. I didn't know that. That's an amazing album. Uh, it's amazing. So we're, we want you guys to listen to it, and we're going to talk more in detail about the tracks. Can you, can you give us a track listing of all the tracks? Yeah. Side A is Abide With Me, Frank, uh, right, Abide Henry with Francis me. Light, and William Henry Monk. Mm-hmm. Um, track two is Well You Needn't, and uh, track three is Ruby My Dear. Um, and then on side B, you got Off Minor, Epistrophe, and, oh, God, uh Crepuscule with Nelly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's amazing. Okay, all those I've listened to this record so many times. Crepuscule. Crepuscule. Yeah, Crepuscule with Nelly. Okay, all right. The um the off minor is is sick. It like Monk plays this intro on there. It's like uh. Do you know what that word means? Do either of you know what that word means? No. What does crepuscule mean? 
it is is a time of partial darkness as the sun has just set. Uh, this in-between time is also called dusk. Oh, so it's like French for dusk. Wow. That's pretty cool. That is cool. Um, Yeah, the reason why I love Thelonious Monk, and uh, I just think he's a brilliant musician. I mean, obviously, all his compositions are just amazing. His voice leading and what he, the the stuff he decides not to play. He was also just kind of like a crazy guy, you know, kind of like just you can look at videos of Monk playing and he's just kind of like a crazy, crazy ass dude. There's there's this video that maybe we can look up, um, Brendan. I don't know if you can, but um, it's like Monk dancing at the piano. Look up like Thelonious Monk dance, dancing. Yeah. That's swinging as hell. I mean, I can't see the video, so. That's Monk right there. Oh, yeah. you can keep playing it for a second. I don't. I don't think the experience Ooh. is the same without the. Is he dancing while he's playing? No. Not at this very moment. Okay. Um, yeah, no, exactly like Jack said. Any listeners out there, just look it up for yourself. It's he, he's not he's not lying about anything he said. <laughs> Thelonious monk dancing. Yes, exactly. Um, so you can get a taste there for like his really you know unique piano approach too. You know, what do you think about that? What do I think about that? What do you think what about, you think about you that? Think about, this is your podcast. What do you guys think about that on that <laughs> piano playing? Were you listening? Yeah, I was listening. He's great. He's great. But what what's what's the distinguishing factor? You know what I mean? Like what what the distinguishing factor of Thelonious Monk versus yeah yeah somebody like Herbie Hancock today? I think I mean Herbie Hancock's voicings are a little bit more like I mean Thelonious sounds slick voicings, but like. Herbie was smooth. I think Thelonious' composition really, um, and the, his character, just like, he was like an eccentric guy. And that really comes out in his piano playing. And I think his, like, influences of, like, stride pianists comes out a little stronger in Monk's playing. And But uh, Duke Ellington is, like, is like one of the ones that I could see as, like, a huge influence. I was asking you, just as someone outsider who doesn't really know a lot, what you thought about that piano playing. I, I think it's great, but sometimes I don't know what what sets it apart from somebody like, like I'm a huge Herbie Hancock fan, you know, but maybe that's just because he's a bit like he's still with us, you know what I mean? And still playing music, right? So I, he's a bit more in the, um, like the front of mind of the public music listening population, right? Especially for casuals, right? Um, so, but when I hear like old Herbie Hancock and then I hear something like that, it's like, oh, they're great, but it almost sounds indistinguishable to me sometimes, right? So that's why I'm asking, like, I don't know what the, like, what does make somebody different? Obviously, Herbie has the benefit of time, where, like, time has led him into, like, things like fusion music and all sorts of stuff that he was a real pioneer of, right? Um, but, you know, like, I know Herbie can, like, play that stuff, but it's different because, like, Thelonious came first, and obviously... Somebody then came before him that was his inspiration, right? So, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, to all piano players, like, I think, um, we're, to we're the, all piano players of today, too. yeah, all piano players today, and, and Herbie, especially, oh, Thelonious was a huge influence, you know? And, um, yeah, they have their own unique style within the lineage and language, but Thelonious is, is one of the OG goats. But he would say that the people before him, like, um, um, stride pianist, uh, 
he the I'm I think it's like Richard Johnson maybe maybe is the name um but like the three Eddie the Lion Smith the stride three great stride pianists I'm not sure um but those were all his influences but yeah so that's cool um before we get too distracted on Thelonious Monk in general our record of the week is Monk's music and we're going to take a deep listen to that this week and we're going to follow along as we dissect it more in detail next week um do you want the do you want the other guys you're looking for the three stride piano so that it has those yeah things? James P. Johnson Willie yes. the Lion Smith Fat Swaller yes that's who I was going to say yes he also got Lucky Roberts and Mary Lou Williams on here yeah yeah so those uh, were like precursors to Monk Definitely. Yeah, yeah, all those were, were precursors to Monk. Mary Lou Williams for sure. Yeah, I'm uh, not the James guy to Johnson. I'm not the guy to like debate goats with, you know what I mean? In this right. particular subject. Or like nitpick, you know, I this is like the James Jordan conversation, you know, Kobe, right? It's like, oh, we're we're meticulously dissecting right, people right. who are the absolute greatest at what they do, you know? Um, yeah, so I mean, one thing in the Monk's music thing that I want you guys to listen for, everyone to listen for, is the interaction between Art Blakey and Monk specifically. And when Art Blakey decides to play, when he decides not to play, when he decides to lay out, um, I mean, when Monk decides to lay out and what Art Blakey does in return to that, some of Art Blakey's rhythms on this, how he plays and shapes certain melodies on there, I think is amazing. Um, how Coleman Hawkins really shapes Ruby, my dear, is something I really want you, everyone to pay attention to. Cause I feel like that was just, he just plays a beautiful melody. And then hearing years later, Coltrane play the melody to Ruby, my dear is like pretty amazing and beautiful. Um, I uh, also want to pay attention to how they play off minor because it's different than like the original trio version of off minor. They play a new arrangement of it with the horns um, Abide by Me, the first track, is a beautiful arrangement of four horn part in four part harmony and horn. And I think it's a beautiful writing. Um, you know, if someone transcribes that for me, I'll give them a big hug. You know, I love to play that at a gig of mine. Abide by Me, arrange that for guitar. That's a what could be a personal project of mine I can add in our next new segment. But we're, um, but yeah, so those are all a bunch of things I want you guys to listen for because it's what why the record really speaks to me and part of the reason why I wanted to put it on here. Especially, especially the amazing solos on all the tracks. I think the longest track there is um, While You Need It on that record. That track's pretty long. But the rest of them, especially Crepuscule with Nelly, I believe Crepuscule with Nelly is a trio. And that's an amazing version an amazing song, you know. I think that's uh, one of Thelonious's best songs, um, and uh, it's kind of wild. You need to listen to that a bunch of times to really understand what's going on. Still, maybe not even understand it. But yeah, so those are like five hit things that you could pay attention to with that song, and that leads us to our last segment before we wrap things up here: the shed, the shed. So every week, I want to talk about what I'm shedding. And you guys can email me, Jack Macklin at Lithio.com, LithioNetwork.com, about what Lithio Media. LithioMedia.com. There you go. About what I'm shedding, you know. And um something that I've been working on is uh is listening to some Grant Green, transcribing on a little Grant Green. Um, I'm working on his solo on Minor League from his record Solid. You know, it's like I don't have a guitar pick, so I'm gonna try to play this the best. But the minor league is the song that goes like, um, yeah, and then Grant has a solo on there, kind of starts out like this.
Uh... But yeah, so I start us out like that. So I've been practicing getting that Grant Green solo down. And I think that that's, uh, yeah. You gotta so, talk close to the mic. Oh, yeah, I gotta talk close to the mic. Sorry. Um, I've been working on getting that Grant Green solo down. Um, I think Grant Green is a hero, and he's always been a hero of mine. Um, it's over a minor blues. You know, I think that his language on there is like super bluesy, yet he also utilizes some different ideas that I kind of would love to get under my playing. Um, his. Use of always having these small variations around the same idea is so interesting to me. How we can always do this, like, um, like shit like that. It's so sick, you know, like. Like that. He plays that like probably like three or four times in that solo. Just that little lick. Yeah. 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 So I'm singing it a little bit, but, um, (laughs) um, I like the segment idea though. This is a cool one. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of goofy and fun and, and, um what really just screwing up your headphones over there yeah you're having uh, a day podcasting bud holy yeah Yeah, um yeah the headphones got a little screwed up over here for a second um but yeah so that's my shed so we could talk about your shedding ideas a lot like you know i'm trying to practice every day get on a nice shed routine um but yeah, I want to hear what other people are practicing. I want to hear what other people are practicing too, for sure. So let me know what uh, you're practicing, and we can kind of get that get that on here and show some other people what we're doing. But I think Grant Green is uh, definitely a amazing way to start doing knowing what we're doing, you know. And um, Grant Green for other guitar players as well is like an, an amazing person to to you know listen to and see play. Or he doesn't can't you know see him play. He's dead. But um, yeah, Grant Green is like an amazing guitar player. You know Grant you Green. Just, did you just kill Grant Green. <laughs> no, <laughs> Grant Green died. I think he died of like some blood disorder or something. Oh gosh. Yeah, but um, yeah. Have you ever heard of Grant Green? No, I have not. Not until you just mentioned him. Yeah, so I'm shedding him. He's he's a classic. Um, yeah, but um, is there anything else you want to talk about, Tassos? You know, here will we wrap things up? He had a heart attack in his car, Grant Green. Oh, really? Yeah. Damn, that's really unfortunate. And he went to the hospital. This is a terrible story. Oh my gosh. What is it? Green spent much of 1978 in the hospital and, against the advice of doctors, went back on the road to earn money. While in New York to play an engagement at George Benson's Breezen Lounge, he collapsed in his car of a heart attack and died January 31st, 1979. Survived by his six children, including his son, Grant Green Jr., who was also a guitarist. Did you know that? No. (laughs) Yeah. Rest in peace, Grant Green. Died at 43. Way too young. Yeah, similar with Wes Montgomery. He died at uh, 45. Damn. All right, you want to wrap? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to wrap things up, though. Um, got some interviews coming up? Definitely got some interviews coming up. Kyle Swan's going to come on the show here in the next couple weeks or so. Um, once he locks down a date, we got a couple other people coming on here for sure. Um but thank you for everyone for joining in on Let's Cool One. We'd love to know your thoughts on the Chicago Jazz Festival. If you're going to be at St. Charles Jazz Weekend, let me know. We can come by a tent. You know, we'll have Let's Cool One t-shirts very soon for you guys to buy. Let's Cool One hats, maybe even Let's Cool One lighters and Jack Macklin hats and t-shirts you can buy and CDs. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, come support Jack Macklin. But, um, 
Yeah, that's about all we got today, folks. Elia, Friday, Saturday. Elia, Friday and Saturday. Come come check me out over there. What's your Instagram? At Jack underscore Macklin underscore. You guys know where it's to find me. a lot of underscores. You think, is Jack Macklin already taken? Yeah. Yeah? Damn. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Jack wanted to end this on a nice note. Uh, no, it's it's fine. I, I like it. I'm, I was thinking about changing my handle. I was thinking like Juicy Jack or something. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right. We ready to cut? What about Juicy Tassos? Would you go into that? All right. See everybody next week. All right. We'll see you guys. <laughs>